It's uh, my uh, distinct pleasure next to uh, introduce the uh, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation, David Meir. Uh, David is a national leader in environmental law, has held numerous positions with the state of Texas and with the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington. He received his BA, BS degree in environmental engineering technology uh, from Cornell University, another Cornell grad, and, uh, and his uh, doctor and master's of environmental law and policy from Vermont Law School. In 2005, he joined the faculty of the Vermont Law School, specializing in environmental law and environmental litigation. Uh, just prior to his appointment as the uh, commissioner of BEC, he was a Fulbright Scholar at uh, the uh, Sun Yat-sen University of China, where he spent the 2010 and 2011 academic year lecturing and developing environmental clinical programs to strengthen and enforce Chinese uh, anti-pollution laws. He also serves as the uh, chairman of the uh, Vermont Monitoring Cooperative Advisory Committee. Uh, please welcome David. So, uh, so Mike, where are you? Mm -hmm. I think that is the last time we let Patrick Berry go first. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, I had to like, cross out half the things I was going to say. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to get to address you today. Even though I'm not really a scientist, I, I want to be a scientist. Maybe someday I'll, I'll get to be a scientist. Um, but I am, I am, unfortunately, just an attorney. And I'm uh, just an attorney practicing public policy at the moment. And so I thought I would start by probably echoing some of what Dean Erickson described earlier, but from my perspective, from, from where I sit, um, in terms of what's the public role of science and uh, what is the critical role of the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative to play and help advance that. I'll, I'll try to tie it uh, as I can towards some of the specific policy issues in my department, but I, I really did want to start at a fairly high level um, sharing um, both my hopes and, and what I think are our greatest challenges. When I think specifically about Vermont and the, the role of this, the, the work that you do, we have this unprecedented opportunity in Vermont. Unlike many states and other parts of the country, we have these amazing assets, these amazing natural resources that are still, while damaged and suffering, are really <coughs> intact. And our challenge is to not let them decline further and to reverse that decline. And to do that requires a transformation of public policy. And we cannot, those of us who are engaged in supporting monitoring and science and doing this work, we cannot sit on what we're doing and think that it's enough. We are not doing enough. And I don't mean in any way to diminish the important work that we are doing collectively, but it is not even close to enough. When we think of, when I think about forests, and we have these great conversations, um, often, most often led by Commissioner Snyder, about how central forests are to Vermont how central and how what an organizing principle they are for envisioning and imagining the ecological health of our state. And frankly, beyond that, the economic prosperity of our state and the wildlife um, issues that we face in the state, this all comes together and focuses around forests. And in order to achieve the vision that we collectively have of protecting this landscape, we have to ensure that these forests are used by people that they're used for recreation, that they're used for the development of forest products. Um, and we have to do a better job of helping the public understand this intimate connection they have to the forest and landscape. We have to help them also understand some things that maybe aren't so clearly and obviously related to forest. The relationship that forests have to water quality, for instance. As I've spent the last two weeks in a series of public meetings across the state in the Lake Champlain Basin talking about this, I have in every one of those meetings said what a central role forests in this state play to the health of our Lake Champlain ecosystem and to every tributary that feeds into it. The same is true on the Connecticut River side and Lake Memphis Magog's uh, watershed as, and the little corner that we have around the Hoosier River. Every one of those watersheds is critically dependent upon the health of our forest ecosystems. I know that people always fully appreciate that. It's also true in the time following Irene and the flooding that we experienced in that time, that we have learned, I have learned in a way that I did not appreciate before, 
how critical our forest and landscape is to the basic infrastructure that we have in this state, to our roads, to our energy systems, to our communities, our businesses. All of this is dependent upon our forests, keeping the soil and the water where it should be on the landscape as part of the ecologically healthy systems that we have when we have healthy forests. The extent to which we have damaged those forests, that we have fractured them, that we have developed them, the extent to which we have um, spread out across the landscape in ways that we've spread pavement and rooftops, we're not just causing water pollution, but we're speeding up the runoff of rain that every time we have flood, flood level um, <coughs> rains, we are, we are in a worse <coughs> position. If we can protect our forests, and if we can reverse the course that we are on as a state in terms of the loss of those forest resources, we will have saved millions and millions and millions of dollars and lives will have been protected and we will have avoided the waste of so many dollars that we've had to pour into fixing roads, rebuilding communities. If we can protect this natural asset that we have in our landscape, we are better off as a community. Not just for the fish, not just for the brook trout, not just for our moose, but we're better off as a, as a community of human beings that live on this landscape. We in Vermont have this remarkable opportunity to transform the public policies that combine all of these things together. And I'll talk in a moment a little bit more about climate change, and when you add that overlay, there's no question that the single greatest asset that we have is protecting these forests. I don't know why I'm telling you this, you know this. I'm just setting the stage for what I want to say next, which is that if all we do is we study and monitor this, the demise of these ecosystems, the demise of the forests in Vermont, we will have nothing to report to our children but bad news. I will not look in the mirror in 20 years and say to myself, I wish that I had done more to make sure that the public understood what I knew. What I knew, frankly, because of the work of folks like you. I look, I'm so proud of the work. I see Neil and Rich Perot sitting back there, Larry Becker. I am so deeply proud of the Department of Environmental, there's Jim Kellogg, the work that the Department of Environmental Conservation scientists are doing to make sure that we collect the right information, that we ask the right questions, and that they get that information to me so I can try to use it. That is the fundamental work that we share together to accomplish. And if we don't do that work, shame on us. And I'm not saying shame on you, because I know that that's what you're doing. But we as a community are not doing enough. The public does not understand in the state of Vermont how critical it is to protect these natural resources, to protect the system of working lands, working farms, working forests, with punctuated by beautiful wild spaces. If we do not protect these resources, if we do not, well, if we do not help the public understand how critical this is, the public policies that we need to put in place will not change. When I am proposing even modest changes to the system that we have in place now, modest changes, I get blowback. Right? People do not like change. Politicians do not want to lead. Politicians want to respond to what they think the public wants. That is the nature of a democracy. That's not a criticism. That is the way we have designed our system. It is the system that we work within. And I'm frankly, having spent a bunch of time in China, think it's the right system. It's a much better system than the alternatives. But in order to make that system work, the public has to understand the consequences of the decisions that we are making. They have to fully appreciate the choices that we have to make in public policy. And they will not make those choices. They will not ask for them unless we make sure they understand. And that is our shared obligation. And in order to do it, we have to work together. So that is one of the reasons why when Mike Snyder said, hey, Mears, I think you should help out and play a role in the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative, that he didn't have to twist my arm at all. I see that the function that this group plays as so critical. And I'm so pleased that Dean Erickson and Professor Pontius are showing such leadership in trying to bring together a gathering like this. Because one critical role that we must play is to convene. We must just meet. When brilliant people like you are all sitting in the same room, good things happen. You make connections, you talk to each other, you form 
um, scientific and knowledge connections, but you all form relationships that will form institutional connections. All of these things are good just by convening. So if nothing else continues, we must continue to have group settings like this where we all come together to talk. The next step is the coordination. It's to actually take that step of following up outside of these rooms to make sure that we build those connections institutionally and organizationally to make sure that things happen and there's follow through. I was, um, I was thinking about um, going around on YouTube to pull up a, a video clip, but I'll describe it instead because I suspect um, that most of you um, have watched The Life of Brian, the, the Monty Python movie. <laughs> There's a scene in there that for me is so representative of what most of my career feels like, which is there's a scene where Brian has just been, you know, he's being uh, crucified. And his girlfriend, you know, runs around the, the, the town to find uh, the group, the, I don't remember what they're called, the Judean People's Front or the People's Front of Judea, whatever they are. And she finds the group and she runs in and she yells to John Cleese and the group, you must do something, Brian is being crucified. And they are listening to her for a moment, and they all say, you're right! You know, we like you, you're a doer, you're about action. And John Cleese says, okay, who wants to make a motion that we form a committee to study the best method for... Re that feels like my life. <laughs> so we've got to get to the doing, right? And the doing means that we take all of this amazing work that you're doing, all of the ideas that you're collecting, when you're thinking in your head, why doesn't somebody do something about the moose or the bumblebees? Or why are we allowing uh, all these second homes to be scattered across the ridgelines of Vermont? If you're thinking those thoughts, you're missing the point. You're the one who knows. You have to make sure that other people know and you have to form alliances with other people of shared information and knowledge and make sure we get that information out. So that's another key role that I've seen the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative move towards, which is building shared information and collecting information in ways and data and studies in a way that can be accessible to all of you so that you can forge those connections and help find ways to communicate it out to the public. And it's that last piece that I think is the most fundamental for us as public policy um, drivers, as scientists, is to get the information out. And we cannot just simply put it out there in, a, in, a, in an abstract and expect anyone to understand it. I have trouble, as someone who pays attention to this stuff, reading half of the abstract you know, summaries of the research that we're doing. It's not enough to write a paper and just put it out there and think somebody will find it and do something about it. You have to figure out, we have to figure out how we translate that information into ways that is, it maintains the integrity of the work and the science, but also advances public policy because people get it. And I'll put forward what may be a heretical idea and notion. I think it's a statement of fact, but it's not necessarily well accepted um, when, I, at least in the academic time that I was in. And Maybe, maybe things have changed. But I think that scientists like you must be advocates. Now some of you, I'd say Jamie, or that you are an advocate. You know, there are a number of you who are actually in organizations where you're advocating. But even within public agencies like mine, there is a sense that scientists must not be advocates. Scientists must maintain their neutrality. The integrity of science depends upon you not having a perspective. But it's not true. You do have a perspective. You care deeply about protecting these natural resources and these systems. Don't pretend that you don't. That's why you've dedicated your entire lives and careers to this work. Put it on the line. Make sure that people know why you're studying. Make sure that you're studying and reporting and communicating on the things that make a difference. And in groups like this, safe spaces, work together to identify what those challenges can be. So let me, let me see you as I close out with some of the things that for me are some of the most critical challenges at the moment for our department in which forests play such a key role. <coughs> Lake Champlain. I've been talking across the state for a number of uh, months, frankly, the last couple of years, trying to figure out what are the public policy opportunities. We're talking about um, better standards for maintaining our, and developing our roads, um, better standards for how we manage stormwater in developed areas, better policies around how we manage stream alteration 
and um, in-stream river channelization work, and, um, and agriculture, addressing a whole set of issues around agriculture. Essentially, every place in which we have stormwater running off the landscape is the biggest set of impacts on the lake. It's not about getting out of sewage treatment plants, not that that's not important, but that's not our biggest challenge um, as a matter of fact, science, or public policy. Those other categories are big. And we have some opportunities, given the sheer amount of forested land in the state, to do a better job with logging practices. And I know Mike Snyder is doing a great job of trying to think about how we improve some of those practices. Um, not necessarily with the full support of the community of folks who do the logging practices. But that's all important work. And I need help. I need help making the case that the forests and forest health are critical. And that this is that this the issue of how we manage land development, which is sacrosanct in Vermont, that we must not touch that. That's left to local governments to decide, case by case by case. But we know it's not working. We have to change that system. I don't necessarily have all the answers to how, but we have to make the case to the public that they must demand public officials change the way we live on the landscape. If that doesn't change, whether it's our roads, or our subdivisions, or big box stores, if that does not change, we will not achieve the goals that we share. And I mean we, not just in this room, but we as, as the state of Vermont. Flood resilience is the other category. We've done a lot of work within our department to try to develop better practices and better standards along with the Agency of Transportation for road infrastructure, culverts, bridges, how roads are designed. We're looking uh, a lot at how other practices that happen on the streams need to be managed trying to figure out ways to help recover the floodplains and their connections to rivers. Making sure that we collaborate with the, the land conservation community to identify both watershed and in, you know, near stream as well as upland um, opportunities for conserving land. These are all places where we are struggling to find money and resources and struggling to find political and legislative support for some of the policy changes we know we need to make. And then last, and yeah, I know you know this, but the whole set of issues around climate change, the specific entry points, I think, when we talk about forest health as they relate to climate change are, of course, in the context of energy choices that we're making, whether it's whether where we site um, renewable energy sources or our issues like biomass, which so centrally connect to the issues of forest health. Um, we're very engaged. Um, uh, Mike Snyder has been a real leader on the biomass side of things. Um, Patrick's group has been critical in terms of getting issues of for, uh, wildlife habitat and corridors integrated and in, in thought about when we um, cite renewable energy projects. This is critical work that <coughs> forests are essential to it. And an area where I think we haven't fully exploited our opportunities, and I know that Commissioner Snyder is thinking about this, is in the area of sequestration. The issue that where we have good healthy forests and we protect them, that we should be able to to use that, There's a, it's an economic resource for the state in terms of a benefit that we're providing to the whole globe, and we should get some, some credit for that. So at the end, uh, our challenge is to transform public policy. At the end, this work that we're doing, whether it's the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative, the work that Neil Cam Kamen and um, others that he's working with on a water monitoring council, the coordination and protection of our, our monitoring systems, the funding for things like the stream gauges, this depends upon you speaking up, speaking loudly, speaking in a coordinated way. There is nobody else that's gonna do it. I don't know what to do, left to my own devices. I need you to be part of this conversation. And that's why I'm so pleased that the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative is, really seems to me to be growing and thriving with the support of the University of Vermont. Thank you. Time for a few more questions. Any questions for uh, Commissioner Mears? Well, I'm glad I don't have to call. <laughs> yes. Well, in, in my town, I see some new houses going up on a floodplain. And how would you? What? How would you? What would you have to do to change that? To, I mean, is, is that a constitutional thing that would have to change, or how? How does that work politically? No, it 
it doesn't require constitutional change. I mean, the first thing to do is to talk to the local select board and make sure they know that it's a mistake. We should not, if we've learned anything post is we should not be building in floodplains or rebuilding in floodplains. Um, so making, at this point, local governments have those, that's decision making best with them. They should also, as a community, be thinking about opting into the National Flood Insurance Program. Flawed though it may be, it does set a basic set of minimum requirements that local governments can meet that help ensure that their citizens have access to flood insurance. Um, but we should also be talking at a state level about whether we need to set some statewide minimums for protecting our floodplains and even more importantly in Vermont, to protect some of the river corridors, those are erosion hazard areas that we know in Vermont as a mountainous area are some of the greatest risk areas. Um, and frankly, we've overdeveloped <coughs> and, and mismanaged those corridors over time. Other questions? Yes, Jim. Oh, Jim, why don't we go with you first? Well, relating to, to Tim's question, I wondered if, if there are opportunities to kind of expand the training program, certification program for select boards. If you get elected, you get this training program for that is a brilliant idea, um, and I'm saying that not just because it, and it was not on my idea, but it is something, frankly, we've been talking about at a &R. Um, There's some real work um, being led by um, uh, Gantz at uh, Fish and Wildlife and some other staff are trying to put together a set of, essentially a, a set of units, natural resource protection units that um, you know, select boards, uh, town planning commissions, and other folks in, in local government that are involved, involved in making those decisions. I think it's a great idea. We're trying to do it on the backs of folks who already have other jobs, but I, I think it's critical that we do it. David, there's a lot of momentum actually in that regard that the you know, Department of Fish and Wildlife actually has a conservation planner that visits with the municipality, and I know Jamie Fidel from the Vermont Natural Resources Council is here, and between the work that's being done at the agency level and the nonprofit level, there's basically whole curriculums specifically designed to work with municipalities uh, for conservation purposes, which could include everything from you know floodplain regulation to you know protecting critical wetland habitat, et cetera, et cetera, including everything from templates for regulations that you can overlay in your communities. So there's a lot of work being done, and just like the theme we talked about, the key is to put it together so that there's there's a synergy from from all of that momentum. Thank you.